Welcome to The Bridgehead with Jonathan Van Maren, bringing you cutting-edge news, commentary, and interviews from the front lines of the culture wars. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead on AM 1380. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. Now, the reason I'm, I'm having this next guest on is because I get asked so many questions about how it is that we should uh, combat the rise of pornography. Now, many of you will know that I actually work with a, a nonprofit organization run by Joshua Gilman called Strength the Fight. Uh, it's Canada's only anti porn nonprofit. And if you want to take a look at, at what they're all about, uh, go to Strength to Fight. Ca. And we essentially give uh, presentations on pornography all over the country. We try to connect people uh, to resources that they need. And, and we, we strive to help people understand what pornography is and why they should care about getting rid of it. So I know I've done uh, programs talking to scholars about the impacts of porn before, but one of the things that I wanted to do was just talk to somebody who works on the pastoral side of things and is used to speaking on porn, talking to those uh, addicted to porn, talking to those impacted by porn, and just walk through a lot of the practical steps uh, that we need to do to keep our homes porn-free, to, to, to quit pornography, to fight pornography in our communities. And so uh, I asked somebody who's uh, more than equipped to have this conversation, and many of you will, will recognize him. His name is Tim Challies uh, of Challies.com. He's a very, very well-known uh, Christian blogger, author, and uh, a book reviewer. And I'll just read his biography as he lays it out on his website. He says, I am a Christian, a husband to Aileen, and a father to three children aged 9 to 15. I worship and serve as a pastor at Grace Fellowship Church in Toronto, Ontario, where I primarily give attention to mentoring and discipleship. And he's written a lot about porn, not only on his blog, which I'd urge you to check out, but also a book called Sexual Detox, A Guide for Guys Who Are Sick of Porn. And uh, he also wrote another book that, of course, uh, plays into that somewhat called The Next Story, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion. So he has a lot of experience uh, fighting porn and helping people uh, rid themselves of porn on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I asked him to come on to have a conversation with me about how we can keep our homes and our communities porn-free. So what I wanted to do on this show was just have a discussion uh, on how we can keep our homes and communities porn-free. As you know, I do a lot of anti-porn work. I work with a, a Canadian organization called Strength to Fight. And yeah, I know those guys. We are fielding questions nonstop on yep. uh, how to kick porn out of our homes, how to strengthen a marriage that has suffered as the result of porn. And I know you've dealt with this issue a lot as well. So I'd like to start by asking you one of the most common questions that I end up getting and what I find is the most difficult one to answer. What do you tell a wife who calls you and says she's caught her husband looking at porn and she asks you what to do next? <laughs> Well, that's an awfully common and, uh, sadly, awfully common and awfully difficult question. But uh, I think the place to start is uh, first to evaluate whether that person's a Christian or not. And if mm -hmm. that person's a Christian, then we trust they're part of a local church. And if they're part of a local church, then they've got some structure in their lives that hopefully will help them deal with it. I think there was a time when it was really hard for pastors to know what to do, and it's still difficult. But every pastor has dealt with that very thing at least one time by now, I think. And so I think local churches are getting better at better, better and better at supporting people through that kind of uh, discovery and the kind of trauma that follows. There's also some pretty good books out there uh, that can be very helpful in helping uh, people work through over a period of time. But how, how do you help uh, afterwards? Let's say you know a resolution is found, the husband commits to stop looking at porn. But what I find very often is is a sense of betrayal still runs very, very deep and, and continues to resurface. It will, it will be fine until, you know, a fight happens several weeks later and suddenly uh, all that anger comes, comes back to the surface because that betrayal is, is still there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's not just a sense of betrayal, right? It really is a betrayal. She has been betrayed. He has betrayed her trust. And that is one of the darkest parts of pornography, the fact that it's it's done away from others, it's done in secret. And uh, she may believe that their, their, their uh, intimacy is fine, that their relationship is fine, and then suddenly she learns this about her husband. And that can be absolutely heartbreaking. I got an email from someone just a few days ago who was talking about uh, some of the trauma of that in her own life and um, just the devastation of learning in her 60s that her husband had been involved in this for all these years. So, uh, again, I think the local church is very, very helpful there and a big part of it, both having other women to come alongside her and to ask her good questions and to answer her questions and just to sit and cry or sit and read the Bible or just help her through in that way. Mm -hmm. Then hopefully the local church is also providing help to them as a couple, uh, either through counseling or through challenging him or through guiding them through uh, a process of reconciliation in certain cases even a process of maybe a a short-term separation uh, i know is not that uncommon so there's a lot that can be done but really i think the local church is a a very important key because that's where you have hopefully spiritually mature people who can come alongside and guide Mm -hmm. how big of a problem do you think pornography is within the church Oh, it's huge within the church. I I don't think the statistics inside the church and outside are all that different, especially among young people. Uh, You know, there's a time when finding pornography was hard, right? Now preventing pornography is the hard thing. And uh, our kids are getting into it long before they're equipped to deal with that. And so if if you're a child of eight or nine years old, you don't even have the categories yet to understand what you're looking at, but somehow there's a draw, there's an allure. And so kids, a lot of kids, are really drawn to it before they're old enough to do much about it. By the time they understand what they're in, they're they're really, if not addicted, they're really compelled to go back to it. And back to it, it's become a, a pattern, a habit. And so right there, we already have a whole generation that's um, very drawn to it and perhaps even addicted to it before they even really have a chance. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've struggled with doing uh, anti-porn activism, doing presentations in churches, is that there seems to be this this very lackadaisical attitude towards porn use as as something that everyone does. It's a a boys-will-be-boys type of thing. It's to be expected. I was at one Christian apologetics conference where I was speaking at porn, and uh, one fellow who was actually volunteering for the conference said there are two kinds of of men, those who look at porn and those who lie about it. And uh, after the presentation, there was one uh, one member of this apologetics organization who said he'd been looking at porn for for 40 years, and he'd given up trying to stop, and his his wife was aware of this. And it struck me that we we take this very... Uh, despairing view of pornography that men are too weak to ever overcome it and that uh, willpower doesn't play into this but secondarily that we should just assume everyone will look at porn and that we should assume looking at porn is the norm and we should accept that norm rather than expecting uh, purity to be the norm sure well I, i think it is the norm in the sense of With young men, men especially, everybody, almost everybody at least has looked at it. Everywhere I go in the world to speak about this issue, I ask the same question, which is, if you're between the ages of 18 and 25 and you've never once gone looking for pornography and you're male, come and talk to me afterwards because i just like to hear your experience, hear Mm -hmm. how that happened. And I've yet to have a single person come up to me afterwards. Uh, That's not true. I've had a couple come and argue the definition of porn to say maybe they haven't. But I've never had someone come up and say, no, I've never looked at it. And Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of teenagers look very awkwardly at their parents or try not to make eye contact with their parents. But I've never had that young man come up and say, no, I haven't looked at porn. So in a sense, it is normal in that everybody's doing it in a certain context in life. It's also very abnormal in that we are made in the image of God. We are, uh, as Christians, indwelled by God, so we know that it's wrong. And we, th- there's part of us, our conscience is accusing us as we do that. So, yeah, we can, we can do what we want to downplay it or minimize it, but the fact is we know that it's wrong. We know that it's evil. And what I see in the church, I don't see that lackadaisical attitude towards pornography amongst Christians, amongst um, especially mature Christians. Mm-hmm. What I see that concerns me is more of an attitude of, yeah, I don't think my kids will do that. Right. When statistically, even with girls, 20 or 30 percent of girls are are looking at porn on a semi-regular basis, and almost all of them will encounter it in their life. It really, really grieves me to hear parents saying, that won't be an issue for us. Uh, part of what I do when I go around is I just I beg parents, please do something. 
get a device, get covenant eyes, do something that will at least begin to take action. I mean, if we can just cut the porn use in half or cut it down to a quarter, we are doing at least something then. Mm -hmm. But what I don't want to hear from parents is, oh, that's just not an issue for us, so we're not doing anything. Yeah, and and, and it's it's turning into a situation even more serious. One of the reasons I got involved in in doing anti-porn work was because uh, uh, through the work I do as a pro-life activist, I was increasingly meeting girls who were describing very strange scenarios to me uh, about boys pushing them into doing certain things that just didn't sound normal, didn't sound uh, natural. Everyone can understand a boyfriend and a girlfriend going too far and making a mistake, but the things that the boys were asking of the girls were not that. Uh, this was learned behavior. It had to come from somewhere. So I started trying to find out where it came from, and I found out that almost all of this was coming from mainstream porn, and that the, the sexual pushiness uh, of the boys uh, was often because they'd looked at porn at such a young age that they thought this kind of sex was real sex rather than porn sex, and some of them had actually ended up committing, inside Christian communities, sexual assaults without even realizing they had done so. Yeah, and the, my book I wrote called Sexual Detox, A Guide for Guys Who Are Sick of Porn, that book grew out of that exact same recognition, hearing young men speak and realizing, oh my goodness, these young men want to get married so they can act out porn on their wives. Right. When they think about, when they talk about sex, they're not talking about a husband and wife making love to one another. They are talking about acting out pornographic acts on a, a willing victim, on someone who will actually allow them to do these things. And so they're debasing and degrading their wives in order to do this. And that was a such grave concern. It just showed how deep porn has gone, that these young men, their sexuality has been shaped by pornography. It hasn't been shaped by parental conversations. and hasn't been shaped, as for hopefully most of us, just by getting married and trying to figure this thing out mm -hmm. together. It's been shaped by them watching hours and hours and years of pornography and of course pornography is inherently misogynistic it is abusive it is violent it's all these things and so what's going on in the bedrooms uh, of people even within the church is that exact same thing what do you say to girls then that ask because i get this question all the time if somebody's been addicted to porn for years and years and years you know they've they've poured thousands of hours of raw sewage straight into their brains should, should i go into a relationship with a person like that well, I think, again, that's where you've got to get with mature people and hopefully leaders within your church, and that's the kind of decision you need to make, hopefully, with dad involved and with other people involved, somebody who can look deep into that man's life in a way that would be inappropriate for a, a young lady to do, mm -hmm. and really get a sense of, okay, where is he at? We believe that God can make all things new. We believe that God is renewing our minds. So we really believe that there can be freedom from this, not only freedom from no longer looking at it, but also freedom from no longer being deeply affected by it, no longer desiring to act those things out, which is, again, why my book title is Sexual Detox. I believe we can detox from this stuff, that it really takes time and it takes effort. So I encourage young ladies to have another man in their life who will be talking to that young man, that potential husband, who will be asking him where he's at, who will be holding him accountable, who will really be learning, is he just putting the porn aside or is he truly battling hard against that? Is mm -hmm. he putting that sin to death? Is he coming alive to righteousness? That's the kind of progress I want to see before a man uh, ought to marry a, a woman that I'm charged to care for. But so often uh, with porn use, it, it gets played off as uh, as something that not only will impact all of us, but but that we can expect it to happen f for a certain stage. And what I what I try to uh, convince men, a, a lot of men, when they look at porn, they know that looking at porn is wrong. I've yet to to find a man who you know looked at porn for two hours, shot his laptop, and figured that was time well spent. Uh, you know, and, and feel like they just accomplished something that was worthwhile. Uh, but at the same time, there's sort of this acceptance that, that, that it will just happen uh, for, for a short span of time. How can we start to change the language of struggling to fighting? Because I find uh, that struggling, while a very accurate term in the context of some people's experience, is also being used as a term to justify this sort of interminable struggle uh, with lust and pornography use that doesn't ever seem to, to, to reach an end in terms of being clean from pornography, being detoxed, as you put it. Right. Yeah, I think that's, again, where the, the Christian um, 
the Christian way of looking at the world and really the Bible can give us such good guidance because the Bible doesn't talk about struggle. It talks about sin, really, right? So it mm-hmm. gives us the word we need to describe this thing. Looking at pornography is sin. And once we know it's sin, we understand the way sin works and that is deceptive. It wants us to believe, you know what, I'm going to do this while I'm young and single. Someday I'll get married and I'll have a wife and I can um, just have sex with my wife and this will go away. Uh, and sin wants you to believe that. It will, it will allow you to believe that. But we know as we study sin, as we look at what the Bible says about sin, we know that sin masquerades that way. It'll let you think that, but really it's out to kill and to destroy you. It's out to deceive you. And so we can we can look at it in that way and say, okay, there will be consequences. This thing is not going to go away as soon as I get married. Uh, it might go away for a little while because sin is tricky that way. It might go away for a few months, but it will come back. So I need to stop this sin now. I need to deal with this thing right away put it to death. And in order to do that, I need to look at what the Bible says about putting sin to death. It's not a struggle. I mean, Mm -hmm. it is a struggle. But that's not really the wording, right? The Bible talks about putting on and putting off. It talks about putting sin to death. It talks in those terms. And it never makes, it never downplays the nature of sin and never downplays the importance of truly doing hard, hard battle against it. Well, my colleagues at Strength to Fight and I, when, when we try to present porn to audiences, what we try to really do is I, I always compare people's grip on porn as as white knuckle tight, and we have to try, when it comes to men at least, we have to smash their knuckles to loosen their grasp on it. And that's why we try to take uh, porn out of the darkness and into the light by describing it as sexual assault. Uh, you know, that there's nothing more truly demonic than a man being physically aroused by the sight of, of a woman being physically destroyed on screen. It's the complete right. reverse of the gospel. And I've, we, we've seen some success with that line of argumentation in helping men realize that this isn't just a boys will be boys problem. It's not just a masturbation habit, but it's actually speaking to something much more disturbing about the way they see women and how their relationships with women are going to develop as a result of this. But you, you speak on this all over the world. What arguments have you found the most effective in actually making people decide, I am gonna, I'm going to break free of pornography? Yeah, it depends so much. You know, different people are struck in different ways. So there's times that I just want to go gently to the gospel and encourage people, here's what the gospel says. It frees you from this. I want them to understand and really measure tone. Here's what God calls you to do through his word. Other times I take, if that's the carrot approach, sometimes I take more of the stick approach, right? And just, guys, this needs to stop. This is pathetic. You are pathetic. And just try and really bring the heat that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so I find there's, you know, different things play for different people. It depends partly who they are, partly how many times they've heard these things, partly how much they've been convicted of this sin, how many times they've failed in trying to overcome it. So I think there's a lot of arguments we can make that can be effective for different people at different places. But always I want to I want to use biblical language when possible. I want to make sure they know that uh, overcoming this is not simply a matter of stopping something, but that it's also beginning something else. So you don't just stop bad habits, but you build good habits. Mm-hmm. And I just really want to encourage them along to help them see what this really, really is on, on the level of their hearts. What's the most encouraging sign you see in the fight against pornography today? Because, you know, as you know, Pornhub released their statistics for 2015. And I did the math for a column I was writing, and it turns out that uh, human beings watched about 500,000 years worth of pornography just in 2015 alone, which means that there was about 12 porn videos consumed for every man, woman, and child on Earth. Where's yep. the encouragement in this fight? I guess the encouragement is that uh, I do meet a lot of young people who can say that they have overcome it and a lot more who are fighting hard. And then there's a whole generation of parents. So uh, I'm not sure how old you are. I'm 39 years old. Mm -hmm. And when my parents uh, raised me, they they gave me access to the Internet, but they had no idea what would be there. And so I, like so many other, for a time and thankfully a short time, blundered into this stuff and was drawn to it. Uh, But... You know, I can I can testify that there really is true freedom, and I know uh, the guys at Strength to Fight can say the same. Like, you really can be free of this sin. Um, 
But what I see now is, is a whole generation of parents who were in the same place I am and are saying, there is no way I am leaving my kids out like that. There's no way I'm going to let my kids experience the kind of freedom I had because we are wise to this thing. Mm-hmm. We know what lurks out there, and we're going to take serious measures to prevent our kids. So we understand the challenge that our kids need to know how to use modern technologies. They need to use the Internet but we also know there are things we can do to help our kids. And so that's where I really see the hope, parents intervening on behalf of their kids. It's just part of raising, discipling kids in the world mm-hmm. today, right, is training them how to use the Internet well, training them how not to use it poorly. Yeah. How much do you think this science of addiction helps to explain the, the masculine draw to pornography and now increasingly the, the female draw to pornography as well? I think somewhere between the language of addiction and the language of heart idolatries is where we need to go. So uh, the the new language of addiction, greater understanding of it, really is helpful on that chemical level, right? Like Mm -hmm. what's actually going on in the brain when you experience a stimulus and when you respond to it, how over time you train yourself. And it shows we're fearfully and wonderfully made, right? Like we are made in such a way that we can do habits and over time those really become a part of who we are. Right. That's great, but that's also alarming, right, when we build bad habits. But then we also biblically have this language of heart idolatries, that our hearts are drawn to things that will give us meaning or that we believe will give us meaning. And so... We know that when it comes to sexuality, that is an idol in our lives. That's something in that moment we are placing ahead of God. It becomes our God. And so I think somewhere those, those, those two worlds can be drawn together, and that's where we'll have a much more holistic understanding of what really is going on when we indulge in these really long-term, deep-rooted kinds of sins. What are the most valuable resources you've seen come out in recent years? Because I know you track this very closely. The most valuable resources to uh, um, bar yourself from porn, so different filters and accountability filters and things like that, uh, different courses to take. I, I have a lot of people who come and ask me, you know, okay, so I've committed to, to stop looking at porn. What do I do next? Yeah. I think, so first, on a just on an intellectual level, I think you have to understand that that's probably not just going to go away. So there's Mm -hmm. a sense in which you have to continue to consider yourself addicted for a very, very long time. Um, Anyone who's grappled with addiction can tell you this, that even though you don't feel it for a couple of days, that doesn't mean you're free of it. Right. Uh, You also need to continue to remove the opportunity, so continue to put measures in place. I, I, I want people to read. I want them to read a book like Finally Free by Heath Lambert or even my book, Sexual Detox, things like that that are fairly easy to read, but will just help, you know, continue to help you in the fight. And read books on, you know, the holiness of God by R.C. Sproul, something that will just give you a glimpse of who God is and who you really are. I think that's so very, very important. So when technology causes an issue in our lives, as the Internet has done for us here, we tend to think that technology will solve the issue as well. I want people to understand First, it's a heart issue. If you know Jesus was using the Internet, he wouldn't be drawn to any of that stuff because his heart wouldn't be drawn to it. Mm-hmm. So deal with your heart first. And then from there, let's go to Covenant Eyes. Let's go to Open DNS. Let's use tools like that mm-hmm. that can proactively filter what we're seeing, but then that can also reactively, like Covenant Eyes, gather a report and send that to someone who can then come alongside us in the fight. So there, there's a lot of tools at our disposal that can be very, very helpful. For for parents, there's a new device called Circle. It's not available in Canada yet. It is in the U.S. It'll be in Canada soon. Mm-hmm. And there's several like it that are coming that are considered just family protection devices. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see a whole new generation of those coming down the pike, and I think those will be very, very helpful as well. So if you had a parent come to you and say, okay, my, my kids are just old enough that they're going to start to use the Internet, and I want to porn-proof my home, how do I go? about it, what would you tell them? So I think, again, those new devices that are coming out are good when your kids are young. So when they have limited access, you can use these devices to lock down what they see, what they see online, and that's appropriate when your kids are young. Once they become teenagers and they're starting to get into Facebook and they're starting to have more access, if they're in schools, they probably need to be doing more research online. That's when I think think tools like Covenant Eyes become very valuable, a tool like OpenDNS, which you can just install on your household router. That's where um, you need to gear it up. And then you've got to know your kids. You've got to monitor what they're doing. If your kids are really bent on getting around those things, then you just need to to lock it down tighter and tighter. If you find that your kids really aren't interested, there's no evidence they're doing stuff like that online, Mm -hmm. 
then I think you can start to relax a little. So you've got to be adaptable. You've got, so much of it comes down to monitoring. You've got to understand what your kids are doing online. You've got to keep up with it. And one other question, because I've had uh, parents ask me this question, especially in an age where, as you say, the older generation often doesn't understand uh, what it's like to look at Internet pornography. I'm, I'm 27. Uh, my parents are around 50. They didn't grow up with this with this problem. So what if somebody my parents' age finds out that one of their children, my youngest sister is 12, has, has been looking at porn, and what do they say? A lot of them say, well, okay, I found out that you know they were looking at this. I saw this on the search history. I know that they're Googling this, looking for this uh, kind of pornography, or just stumbled on pornography and ended up looking at it for a while. Uh, what do we go and say to our kids, and how do we approach them? Yeah, I think approach the kids carefully and with lots of questions and without shaming them, at least initially. Mm -hmm. But really, parents ought to be having this discussion with their kids way, way before. So mm -hmm. when your kids are... Uh, eight or ten or whenever they begin to first use the internet in small ways. You've got to start having this conversation about the kinds of things they will see online about, um, you know, not in graphic detail, but just warn them about some of the things that happen from pictures of naked people all the way to people approaching them and pretending to be kids when they really aren't. They just need to be aware of those dangers. Just like if you send them outside, you tell them not to speak to strangers. And, right. Um, you know, not to pet strange dogs, things like that. So you're just giving them those basic rules. And then over time, you open up that conversation more. So hopefully when they're teenagers, you're asking them questions. Are you looking at pornography? Do you feel like you want to? Have you seen anything that concerned you or that surprised you? Or asking those kinds of questions. And then again, hopefully your technology, your, whatever you're using, is generating some kind of report where you can see this is what my kids are doing online. I'm starting to see a trend of searches here. Or I'm starting to see, or I just full out see he searched for this the other day or he looked at this site. Mm -hmm. That gives you the data to then approach your kids. And when you approach your kids, you're, you're working toward the heart, right? It's not right. just dealing with their behavior. You're taking that behavior as an indication of what's going on in their heart. And you're working forward from there. How can you shepherd their heart through these issues and help them reach salvation and spiritual maturity? All right, just to conclude then, what's the one thing you wish everyone knew about pornography? That it is just pure evil. It promises joy, and it delivers nothing but evil. It's hard to believe when you're young and you're aroused and you so badly just want to look at it, but it is pure, pure evil. It promises joy. It only ever delivers misery. Well, Tim, thank you so much for taking the time. No problems. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, that was author and blogger Tim Challies. You can find more of his work at challies.com. And if you would like to connect with an organization here in Canada uh, that seeks to fight porn on a day-to-day -day basis, the only organization in Canada that employs people full-time in the war against pornography, please go to strengthtofight.ca. And please send in an email if you're struggling with porn, if you know someone who's struggling with porn, or if you just want more information. It's so important that we educate ourselves on these important tasks. Well, thanks so much for tuning in again this week, and we hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks so much for listening.